Let us begin then with the subject of today, which is the fugue. Every educated person should know what a fugue is. Why? Because it's an intellectual uh, model, an intellectual paradigm that surfaces in a number of disciplines. For example, uh, in poetry, oddly, uh, if you've ever peeked at Thomas uh, uh, T.S. Eliot's The Four Quartets, the structure of a fugue is referenced there frequently. We could go to literature, uh, a novel written about the same time, Aldous Huxley's Point Counterpoint. It's framed in the shape of a fugue. We could go to geology. Geologists occasionally will say, this particular crystal has a fugue-like structure to it, turning to painting. There are painters of the 20th century, I can name at least three, uh, Franz Kopka, Henri Valens, and Joseph Albers, who used to be the dean of our own school of art and architecture, they all painted fugues. And we will be looking at Albers' fugue, which actually happens to be in your textbook uh, when we come to section uh, this week. So be sure to bring your textbooks to section this week because because we'll, uh, we will be uh, using them. I'm interested in the fugue also because of this book, Douglas Hofstadter's Girdle Escher Bach. Oh my, it's heavy. My, my, I didn't bring in my copy. This is the Bass copy that Linda was kind enough to pull over. Mine is a paperback. It's not this heavy. But in a way, this is, is indicative because it's heavy reading. Anybody ever peeked at this book and any other? Good. Is it Adam? Yeah, yeah Adam. Uh, what course did you read this in? I'm recommended by friends. I can follow about the first 25 or 30 pages or so. Then when it gets to the math, it really gets uh, over my head. But what it is is an attempt to use the fugue as a way of bringing a common mode of understanding to the visual arts, to mathematics, and to music. Uh, the musician that is uh, foregrounded here, of course, is J.S. Bach, the master of the fugue. So we want to know about how fugues operate. So let's take a, take a look at the specifics here. The term fugue actually comes from an old Latin word, fuga, which means flight or to fly. So in a fugue, what you get is one voice going ahead, leading ahead, and another voice following it. Now I just used the term voice there. Fugues can be written for uh, actual voices, sounding voices, or they can be written for instruments such as the, the violin or, or the cello, individual lines. They can even be written for instruments that can play several lines or several parts at once. The piano can do that, the organ can do that, even the guitar, and occasionally the violin will be asked to do that. Fugues have been written for as few as two voices. Yes, you could have a two-voice fugue, up to as many as 32 voices. Uh, and uh, they can be, uh, as mentioned, um, uh, written for, and they are best perhaps performed on, these keyboard instruments that have the capacity to play many lines, many parts, many voices at once. The greatest collection of fugues, as you may have uh, may have bumped into, uh, heard about, or at least heard the term, is this collection of preludes and fugues by J.S. Bach called the Well-Tempered Clavier. First of all, what's a prelude? It's just a warm-up piece. You sort of get relaxed, you get to see your fingers, get a feel of the keyboard or the, of the lute or whatever it might happen. Maybe be a prelude, a pre-play, a warm-up. And then we go on to the meat of the issue, uh, which is the fugue. Now, why is this called the well-tempered clavier? Anybody know? Anybody have? That's an odd term. Clavier just means keyboard, the well-tuned keyboard. Thoughts there? Well, what was going on in box day is that they didn't have a keyboard that... They didn't have a tuning system in which all of the pitches were exactly a half step apart. Some were slightly closer together and then others farther apart. And the key of C actually had a slightly different sound than the key of D. And it's only in the 18th and 19th century that we gradually shifted from an unequal keyboard to an equally tuned keyboard. So Bach is kind of part of this transition to the equal tuned keyboard. He was getting close to the equal temperament of the modern keyboard. And that's why he called it the well-tuned 
uh, keyboard. And it, uh, by tuning it this way, it allows you to modulate to all keys. And that's what he did in this collection. He wrote a, two books, one in 17, about 1722 when he was in Curtin, and another about 1742 when he was in Leipzig. And in each of these books, we have a total of 24 preludes and fugues. One prelude and fugue in C major, one prelude and fugue in C minor, one prelude and fugue in C uh, sharp major, and one prelude and fugue in C sharp minor, and so, and so on it goes, and all the way up to the keyboard in that fashion. Two books of those. And this is kind of standard fodder for those that want to become professional musicians. Okay, so that's what, that's what uh, that is uh, about, the well-tempered um, well-tempered clavier. Uh, we've been referencing Bach here, and nobody, of course, uh, wrote better fugues than J.S. Bach. Uh, some continued, some continued to write fugues. Mozart wrote some fugues, Haydn wrote some fugues, Beethoven wrote some fugues, and so on. Uh, and even into the 20th century, we have a few composers. Paul Hinnemith used to teach at Yale, uh, Dmitry Shostakovich, uh, they wrote fugues. But generally speaking, the fugue has its heyday in the Baroque period, roughly 1600 to 1750, the heyday of Bach and Handel. How do fugues work? Well, they start out, as mentioned, with one voice leading forward, and then another voice imitates that voice, exactly. Now, if that following voice, here's a question, if that following voice imitated the leader exactly from beginning to end, what would we have? Hmm? A round, okay, good. That's what we would have, a round. Or we could call, use the, the fancier uh, music word, a canon. Canon, round, the same thing. One voice imitating the other exactly from beginning to end. But in a fugue, what happens is after the main idea, which we'll be calling the subject, the main idea is stated, then the parts go their independent ways, uh, generating counterpoint. But they're not ex exact. They're not uh, precise duplications of the rhythms and the pitches of the leaders. So what we could do would be to visualize this in a, in a, a sort of a crude way up here. You have a leader and then a follower, and the follower duplicates the main idea, which we're going to call the subject, for a period of time, but then it kind of breaks off. So voices will come in and duplicate a certain amount of material and then break off and go their own way. So that's a good way of thinking of the beginning of a fugue, which we will call the exposition. I'll come back to that point in a moment. Notice here I put a little silly little tree up here. We could say that we have the, uh, the genus polyphony here. We've got monophonic texture, homophonic texture, and polyphonic texture. So within polyphonic texture, we have non-imitative texture, and then a stream of imitative polyphony and then two forms of imitative polyphony, rather strict, exactly strict, imitative polyphony, the canon, and less strict imitative polyphony, the fugue. Okay, questions about that so far? All right, let's go back to the beginning of a fugue. We have this opening melody, the distinctive part of it, which we're going to call uh, the subject. That's just what we call the melody in a fugue, the subject. And the way this works is, in a, in a fugue, each of the voices, in turn, will come in with that subject. One will start out, then another will come in, then another will come in. After all of the voices are in, we're at the end of what we call the exposition of the fugue. Now, we've had the, the term exposition before, and where was that? Uh, over there, Elizabeth, I hear you. Yeah, sonata form, sonata allegro form. So we, and what do we, what do we mean by exposition there? Well, it's a chance where you present all the, all the, the themes. And we talked about first theme, and second theme, and closing theme. Well, here in a few, we have just one theme but everybody's going to get a chance to present it. And after everyone has a chance to present it, every voice has a chance to present it, then we're finished with the exposition. All the voices have exposed the theme in their range. After that, we go on to what's called the episode of a fugue. What happens in an episode? Well, usually it modulates key, and the, the vehicle through which composers frequently modulate is 
melodic sequence, either up or down. You can kind of move around by using sequence. You can get to different places by using sequence. So it tends to be uh, a contrapuntal because it's using little motives from the theme. It modulates, moves around a lot, goes to different keys, sounds a bit unsettled. If you were to think back on sonata allegro form and try to find an analog for sonata allegro form in the fugue episode, what would it be? What is the episode of a fugue like in sonata allegro form? Roger? Exactly, the development section. So these episodes in a fugue are sort of mini development sections. So visualize, if you will, we start out here with the exposition in which all voices present the subject. Then you have this kind of free period in which the, the uh, motive out of the subject is played with, developed, moved around different pitches. Then the subject will come back in a new key because we've modulated in the episode. And subject in just one voice, new key. Then another episode in which there's modulation, more counterpoint, more movement. Another statement of the subject in a new key. Uh, another episode, another statement of the subject, and on it goes until uh, we run out of energy usually about after four or five minutes or so, uh, at which point the composer will bring the subject back, maybe in the bass or in the soprano, in a very prominent range in the tonic key, and we have the sense, ah, this is a very solid moment. Yes, this fugue is ending. And maybe they'll throw, upon one, or two, throw one or two chords on it in, but that, that's it. Uh, so it's a complex form, but maybe not quite as complex as Sonata Allegro form. Uh, what's a definition then? If you're taking notes there, what's a definition of a fugue? Well, I wrote a, de a definition of a fugue, and I will read the definition out of the textbook. Students don't like this, I found, if you read out of a textbook. But I ought to be able to do this since I wrote the textbook. Okay, so um, I'm going to read, read a good definition of a fugue here. A uh, definition of a fugue. Uh, a composition for two, three, or four parts, played or sung by voices or instruments, which begins with a presentation of a subject in imitation in each part, the episode, excuse me, the exposition, continues with modulating passages of free counterpoint the episodes, and further appearances of the subject and ends with a strong affirmation of the tonic key. Well, you can't write all that down, but if you want to just put in your notes for definition of fugue, see page 144 of the text. It, fortunately, as I say, uh, it's easier to hear and look at fugues uh, than it is to define them. All right. Now, today we're going to do something different. It's the only day in our course where we're actually going to look at music, okay? We've handed out music for you, an entire piece, an entire fugue by J.S. Bach here. And ideally, I guess we'd be in a, in a seminar format and we'd all be standing around the piano here. So my first question for you is, for how many voices is this fugue written? Look at just the first page and look vertically and see what's the maximum number of pitches you have sounding simultaneously at any one moment. Um, Caroline, is it? Three, okay? Yeah, we have three. If you, if you look through there, there, sometimes at the very beginning, there's just one voice, and then there are two voices, and then there are three voices, three lines. But it never gets to be more than three lines. So we have our exposition here, and it consists of three statements of the subject. We're going to call these three voices, or, or lines, the alto, the soprano, and the bass which comes in in bar uh, seven there. So here's the little bit of the beginning of this. So that's our exposition, because each of the voices, alto, uh, soprano, and bass, has come in and presented the subject. Then we have bars 9 and 10 here.
what's that? If I just go. Jerry, what's that? It's a melodic sequence. And which direction is it going, up or down? Well, that's hard, maybe harder than you think. Generally going down. Not because the line is going down, but we're starting each time on a successively lower pitch. Uh, and this sequence takes us. So we've started in this kind of tonality. Which is minor, but now by the time we've gotten to bar 10 and 11, particularly, we've modulated. So that's what our little episode was in bars 9 and 10 there. It allowed us to move from a minor key to a major key. And now the subject comes back in, and as you can see, what voice is it in there? What voice is the subject in in bar 11? Pretty straightforward. Somebody yell it out? Soprano, okay, so here, heads up in the soprano. So there we are, nice statement of the uh, theme in a major in the soprano. What happened in that little episode? We were here, and now we're here. Modulated again to minor, and is there in bar uh, 15, where's the subject? Which bar? Chris? Alto part, good, thanks. So there it is in the alto part. That's an interesting uh, moment there because we've got a three voice fugue and how many hands does the performer have? Obviously two. So uh, at some moments, these hands are gonna have to share a subject and that's what happens in that voice. When you play this, take a look there, at the very last measure of that page, it must be 15. Starts out, my left hand is playing here. And then the, left hand has to get out and pick up the counterpoint in the bass, and the right hand takes over that subject. But it's the jo job of the pianist there, who, or the keyboardist, who's ever playing that, to really lean on the inside of your hand there. Because when you normally play, play these instruments, there's a tendency, and I'm sure Santana is a far better keyboardist than I, will confirm this, there's a tendency to roll to either side. It's easier to play bass and soprano. What's hard to do is to get those inner voices. So there's, the keyboard player has to and then If you didn't hear it, then that wasn't a good performance. All right, now that takes us across the page there. We're now back in a, in a minor key. Uh, this is bar 16 and 17. And in bar 17, 18, 19, beginning of 20, we have an interesting moment. It's called invertible counterpoint. What do we mean by that? Well, he has a motive. call that motive A. And he has another motive, motive B. So there's B in the alto, A in the bass. And together they sound sort of like this. Okay, cool. Now, next three bars, what happens? Well, he takes B. So he takes B and puts that below A. He's switching the positions here. A is now 
both of these motives are coming up in rising sequence. So let's go back to the beginning of 17 there and we'll, we'll listen to the switch. So that uh, goes by very quickly, right? How long do you think it took Bach to, to figure that out? I don't know, he's a very good contrapuntalist, maybe boom, like that. Uh, I'd have to sit there, Santana, how long would it take you to figure out some invertible counterpoint that you could think up one melody, think up another melody that would be a harmony against it, but yet you could flip the two, and it would still sound pretty darn good. It would take a long time to kind of work that out. So that's what's kind of neat about fugue. There's all these intricacies embedded in them that almost sail by the, the general listener unless we happen to have the music right in front of us and can dwell on them. All right, so that takes us over now to bar uh, 20 where we are here back, I guess, in our tonic key of C minor and the theme is up in the soprano. final statement in the soprano. A couple of interesting points there. When we concluded this piece, we had this sound. What's a little bit surprising about that? We're ending a piece, it's called a Fugue Number 2 in C minor. We are ending here with... That sounds like a minor chord at the end? No, no, major chord. All right, so he's changed it. This is a standard gamut, gambit from the late 16th right through the 18th century. Last chord, they didn't like to end pieces in minor. Maybe it's too depressing or whatever. Ugh. I don't want to do that. So, ya di di pa pa ya pam pam with the major third up there above. That's called a Picardy third, maybe from the old French word picard, which means sort of sharp or pointed. So we have a pointed ending there. We have a major ending. Here's another po uh, issue uh, when we're all, since we're on the topic of points, and that's called a pedal point. What was J.S. Bach known as in his day? Was he known as a great composer? What was he known as? How did he earn, basically, how did he earn his living? He played the, Evgeny, more, yeah? He played the organ. He was the great organ virtuoso of his day. And I think at the end of this particular fugue here, it's interesting, he just has that line sit there. On the organ, that would just be fine and dandy because you'd put your foot down there on that low C and la, la, and that tonic note would continue to hold. But if you were writing this for the clavichord or the harpsichord or the piano, what happens to that sound once you hit it? It dies away. I think in the end of this piece here, Bach had the sound of the organ. He didn't read, he wasn't thinking, gee, if this is really for, for harpsichord or something, I better write this like this. strong tonic sound at the end. He may have had the sound of the organ there uh, in his ear. But perhaps the important point here is this idea of a pedal point, because we've actually even talked about that before in the Johannes Brahms variations on the theme of Haydn that was performed Saturday night. Pedal point is what? Anybody can define pedal point for us? Hmm? Well, what goes on? It's pretty simple. Uh, Roger? 
Yeah, a bass holds a note, and basically you're just kind of running over top of one, possibly two harmonies up above it, but it all sounds con uh, consonant. So uh, just be sure of the idea of one note, usually in the bass, just holding, holding, holding for a long period of time. Um, Linda, turn the volume down. I hear a humming in the back. Oh, that's good. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions about that fugue by J.S. Bach? Anybody want to ask anything about that? Marcus, that works for you? Ugona, okay. Thaddeus, qu no questions? Um, Frederick. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, thanks for bringing that out. Um, there at the end, we could even have, you're right, four, maybe even five notes played at once. So this idea that you, once you have three parts, you can only have three parts. Or once you have a five-voice fugue, you can have no more than five voices, breaks down at the very end. Why would you imagine a composer would want to do that, Frederick? Well, uh, well, no, it's not that hard, because you can, once you get used to the idea of a C major triad, you, a musician would look at that end and say, oh, I've just got a C major triad, I'm going to just bang down on it. So that's not hard technically or intellectually. But why would a composer, you raised a very interesting point here, why would a composer want to add more notes at the end? I think it's a pretty straightforward idea. Uh, David? Michael? Michael, yeah. Yeah, just make it louder, make it more sonorous, big bang ending sort of thing. Yeah, to tell the listener once again that this is something special that we're probably at the end. All right, so let's listen to just a bit of this. We've had one version of, the, of this. Let's listen to a, a contemporary jazz ensemble uh, playing. It starts out with a kind of guitar uh, synthesizer with a piano here, and then we'll see what the other instruments are. Here's a, here's a jazz rendition of this same fugue by Bach. instrument is playing this bass line. Okay, here we are in bar 13. Fifteen, subject in the inner voice. Our invertible counterpoint. Switch. Subject soprano. Now just modulating from one key to the next here. actually do repeat that tonic note. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. And then what they do is go off and improvise on that. But it's interesting the, co the similarity between jazz style and um, jazz style and Baroque music. Why is that the case? Well, Baroque music has a lot of driving rhythm in it, kind of regular, regular rhythm in it. And jazz has a kind of regular pulsating rhythm in it, too. I ask you, what instrument was playing the bass line there? And uh, Daniel, you started going like this. So what were you doing? The double bass of the. But is it is it a bowed? No, it's a plucked, a pizzicato double bass. But that's a standard I instrument in a jazz quartet, jazz jazz ensemble. But it, it's a it's a very strong bass, and Baroque music also has a very strong bass. So there are lots of similarities between contemporary jazz 
and uh, Baroque music. And sometimes these jazz ensembles like to get to this Baroque music and, and resurrect them in a modern uh, idiom. Uh, all right, so normally a fugue is a freestanding piece, or you could have an entire movement written as a fugue. Uh, Haydn court, the last movement of Haydn quartets will sometimes do that. A Beethoven piano sonata might do that. But usually they're freestanding pieces. Occasionally you run into a fugue that's embedded inside another movement. You might have a movement in sonata allegro form, and you get to a particular section, let's say the development section, and the composer says, well, I want to write a fugue here as my development. When that happens, we call it a fugato, a fugato. So a fugato is a fugue placed inside another form. So we're going to listen to an example of this from the Romantic period, in which we have the young composer Georges Bizet. He was exactly your age when he wrote this. He was 19 years old. Uh, Georges Bizet wrote this symphony. There's a lovely romantic string sound, sort of break your heart string sound. And then uh, we have a segue. We have kind of a romantic transition here as he changes mood. And then a fugue will break out. And it will start in the bottom voice. So I'll tell you that much. And my question to you, or my challenge to you, is this. What's the order? Uh, let's say, and I'll tell you this, we've got a four-voice fugue that's going to start here. Can you track the order in which the voices enter? You know, you got the four, you got the bass, tenor, soprano, or bass, tenor, alto, and soprano, or soprano, alto, tenor, bass. They can come in any one of four different, um, well, probably even more than four permutations, but the order might be uh, alto, bass, soprano, tenor. It might be bass, alto, tenor, soprano, or soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. We don't know. And that's your challenge here to see if you can track the subject. Here we go. Okay, we're going to stop it there, just from the pause there. That's all four voices are in now. Could anybody on just one hearing tell me what the order was? Uh, okay, let me choose. Uh, somebody did different here. Robert, I haven't called on you this morning. Okay, start with bass. Or maybe even an octave lower. Yeah, it actually went to the alto. And there it then went, where? Tenor. And then finally, yeah. Way up high in the first violin. And now we're going to get a um, an episode in which he's going to play with just a motive, and then the subject will come back. So here are two questions for you. In which, which voice is the subject coming back, and what's happened to the subject when it comes back? It's changed in one way. Let's stop it there. Any takers on that? If we were doing a quiz on this, we'd give you three or four playings of that. Which, which uh, voice did it come back in? Thaddeus? Uh, not bad. We would take that. 
um, because it's kind of high ten. I'm playing a kind of tenor range here. Uh, I think it was more cellos, and we'd probably with bassoons, we'd probably call that bass, bass voice. But but fair enough, ten tenor. Uh, and what happened to it? <laughs> Roger, minor. So he modulated to a different key and then gave you the subject in uh, a minor key. And that's kind of the way these uh, uh, fugues operate. Give you an exposition, episode which you change key, bring back the subject in a different key. All right, so we've now had a fugue from the 19th century, although we would call it a fugato because it's embedded in this lovely, lovely Sonata Allegro movement. Um, let's turn to a fugue from the 20th century, and for this we go to Leonard Bernstein, and you can see the playlist up on the board. Uh, New Haven used to be a favorite tryout city for Broadway musicals. Indeed, there was a, a, a musical entitled, never went anywhere, it was entitled We Bombed in New Haven, meaning that the tryout uh, of, of the particular musical uh, was not a success. And where would, they, where would they try out in New Haven? What was the great theater? for this. Hmm? The Yale Rep Theater? Any other takers? The Schubert Theater. Yeah, actually, in that period, the Yale Rep was actually a functioning uh, house of worship. It was a church at, the, at that particular, what's now the Yale Rep. Uh, so it was at the Schubert Theater, which has been a, here for a long, long time. So Leonard Bernstein came in here with a show in 1952 called Wonderful Town, and he tried it out there. And generally speaking, it was a success, and he took it down the tra train tracks there to Broadway. Uh, but he took some music out of it, some music that he thought actually was a little bit too complicated uh, for the choreography that he wanted to, to work into it. Later took that material and worked it into a freestanding piece called Prelude, Fugue, and Jazz Riff. So we're going to look at now just the uh, fugue portion of it, because it's a very interesting kind of fugue. It's a, a very complex fugue. So we're going to start out here, and I'm going to break this. We'll listen, we'll stop, we'll listen and stop uh, so that we can um, uh, focus on particular passages. So as we start to listen, uh, see how many voices there are in Leonard Bernstein's fugue. Have a general sense of what the range is, soprano, alto, bass. Uh, what else do we need? Oh, yeah, what instruments are playing here? That's uh, 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 the exposition and a little bit of a development there. So what instruments? Hmm? Ducks? Yeah, saxophones, yeah. Okay, Neelan says, says saxophones, and he's right. Yeah, so saxophones there. Um, so we've got, and how, roughly how many did you hear? Two, three, four? Yeah, maybe four, maybe four different saxophones, sort of alto sax, maybe baritone sax in there. Um, and there was one, so we, we, we were playing this out, and this is rather uh, syncopated uh, a fugue subject. Da, beep, 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 beep. Let's listen to it uh, again. No, we don't have time to do that, but here's one thing that, that happened. That kind of sound, deep. Then after uh, one episode, one of the saxes brought back that subject. What's it doing there? What is that? What's the relationship there? Yeah, it's, it's just inverting it. It's taking the intervals and flipping them. And that's what composers love to do with fugues. And we'll be talking about interchangeable parts, reciprocal relationships with the mathematical quality of fugues. And so that's what's happening here. We have a moment of melodic inversion. And sometimes in fugues, and Bach did this in the musical offering, he can take his fugue subject and run it backwards run it backwards from beginning to end. So they like to have these kind of mathematical permutations of these intervals. It's very cerebral stuff, this fugue business. So there we had just a moment of Leonard Bernstein writing um, uh, a little bit of uh, inversion. Now, what we're about to hear next is something of a surprise because we get a second fugue subject. 
And it's a different fugue subject. It's not uh, sy syncopated. It's rather lyrical. Da -di -da -di -da -di -dum -di -da. Something like that. So it's nice and nice and lyrical. Um, and let's listen to how he now fold, unfolds a second fugue subject. So what we have here is called a double fugue. He's got one exposition with one fugue subject. Now he's going to give us a completely different exposition with yet, yet a second fugue subject. <laughs> And then number one comes back. Okay, we're going to pause it here because he's now about to do something rather interesting. The Bach used to do as well, and Bernstein was a consummate musician uh, and studied uh, Bach, had Bach coming out of his ear. So he knew about this particular trick. It's called stretto. You can design a fugue subject, uh, not only that it could go upside down, but in which the intervals, instead of coming in long succession, could be piled right on top of one another. So the way he sets this thing up to begin with is this, this, maybe this, and then this. But in the next section, it's going to go this, 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 and this the intervals back up on each other because they have been arranged to be consonant at key points, and that's called stretto. Uh, Italian word stretto, kind of tight, tight entries here. So here is a fancy little bit of counterpoint by Leonard Bernstein that once again goes by very quickly. Here. Now he's going to bring back the two subjects together. We have one and two together. Episode. Syncopated episode. One. Two. So it's a pretty nifty little fugue there by Leonard Bernstein with lots of intricate counterpoint uh, involved in it. All right, let's end now with a fugue of J.S. Bach. And for that, we're going to turn to an organ fugue that he wrote about 1710. 1710, when he was a young man in Weimar. Here is that fugue subject. Yum, bum, bum, ba, ta, 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 and on and on and on it goes. What's of interest about this subject? Well, two things. First of all, as I sing this, ya, ba, ba, bum, what is that? Uh, it's a arpeggio, yes, it is, but it's an arpeggio of what? It's a triad, just a minor triad. Minor track. One, five, three, one. If I skip this note here. As I come to every strong beat in this theme, every strong beat, I have a member of the triad, that same either G, B flat, or D. So these triads, as we said before, are really the structure, the, the backbone onto which uh, a composer like Bach will place the flesh of a fugue subject. So it's very triadic, and it sounds pretty secure for that. Now, here's another thing that this fugue subject does, and many other fugue subjects. It starts with quarter notes. Yum, quarter 
quarter, quarter. Then next measure, eight, 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 eight. eight. And then we get in here, eight, 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 d, 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 It's gathering speed. Of course, the beat isn't going any faster. The tempo is staying the same. He's simply writing shorter note values, which has the psychological impact, as we've said several times, of giving the sense of movement, gathering speed here. Uh, it's like a train pulling out of the station. We want to get on this train. This thing is really starting to roll after five measures or so. So it's a pretty nifty uh, fugue subject uh, here. And we're going to listen to this now. Uh, and what I'd like to do is the following. We're going to listen to the entire piece. Listen to the entire piece. Think about as the, as the uh, voices come in, think about where they're coming in. Can you tell me what the trajectory of the voices is in the exposition? And I'm going to turn out the lights here because sometimes it's good just to kind of go off into your own world, close your eyes. But I would like you to do the following thing, kind of lean back, get comfortable, close your eyes. But every time you hear uh, the fugue subject, so on. Every time you hear that fugue subject, raise your hand so that I know you're recognizing that as the subject. Because listening to fugues, it's basically one thing. Differentiating between a passage in which you've got a statement of the subject and an episode, where there ain't no statement of the subject. OK, so this is a three minute and 20 second fugue. And we're going to listen to the whole thing. But do raise your hand when you think that fugue subject is in there. Soprano, alto, tenor, and now bass. Yeah, there it is. It's in, in one of those inner voices. It's a little bit disguised, but it's in there. on top in the soprano. Another episode, descending sequence this time. Rising sequences here. Falling sequences. In the 
face. Okay, so that's a wonderful fugue by J.S. Bach, and we could, we're going to talk more about this in section, this idea how you can run your fugue parts this way, or you could order them this way. Uh, you can think of these co constructs mathematically, or you can think of them musically, but you're all working with the same kind of material. As you go out, one final fugue by Glenn Gould, who is going to teach you how to write a fugue as he sings a fugue to you. So you want to write a fugue? You've got the urge to write a fugue. You've got the nerve to write a fugue. So go ahead. So, so you go want to write a fugue. You've got the urge to write a fugue.